OK, um, good evening uh, to everyone that's uh, joining us this evening. Um, uh, we're just having a session um, that came out of last. Uh, we had a session for staff last week and the most common uh, one of the most common questions was about vaccination in children. So um, we're having a session this evening. Um, I've uh, got uh, Nigel Crawford, who's a pediatrician from the Royal Children's Hospital, joining me um, tonight to um, to present and then to help uh, answer any of the questions that you might have about um, vaccination and uh, COVID in children. Uh, just give me a second to get my slides up. Um, and just checking that's all OK. So um, uh, we so uh, joining me is Nigel Crawford, who is the incoming chair of the um, Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. Um, uh, we go back a little way. I did a, a sabbatical with uh, Nigel a number of years ago and uh, at the immunisation service at the Children's Hospital. Nigel's also the director of uh, SAFIC at uh, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and in the Department of Paediatrics at uh, the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm just going to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands that we're collectively meeting on um, in the Kulin uh, Nation um, and like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging and uh, extend that acknowledgement to any um, uh, First Nations people that might be joining us today. It is also always worth reflecting um, that uh, uh, that last year particularly we had some success in um, protecting First Nations people from the impacts of COVID. Unfortunately that's been challenged uh, somewhat this year but uh, vaccination is a very important tool to um, uh, to keep uh, people safe, including uh, uh, our First Nations um, uh, populations. So what we're going to talk about tonight is um, I'm just going to talk briefly on uh, COVID and, and children and in particular the implications of the uh, Delta variant. Um, just about a little bit about the broader impacts of COVID on children and, and uh, schools. Um, and then I'm going to throw over to Nigel to talk about vaccination in children and then uh, talking uh, speaking to children about um, COVID. So these are the figures as of a couple of weeks ago uh, the in the most recent uh, national report. And as you can see that um, unlike last year, um, the, uh, the age of uh, people with COVID has shifted markedly down. Last year there was more of a U-shaped curve that uh, there were a lot of people in their 20s and then um, obviously uh, quite a lot of people, uh, elderly people were affected by COVID. But this really reflects um, the impacts of uh, vaccination in uh, protecting uh, particularly older people. You can see of the smaller number of um, older people who have been affected, there's still a pretty severe illness and obviously these are mostly unvaccinated uh, people. But in children, um, even though there have been um, you know, several thousand cases um, in, in children, um, there's a, a relatively small proportion of those have been hospitalised and a very small number of those have required um, intensive care. Um, there has been one death in a teenager that's uh, been recorded and uh, we understand that uh, the child also had um, pneumococcal meningitis, which is obviously a, a condition that has a high mortality. So um, the death was probably with COVID rather than um, uh, because, uh, due to COVID. Um, also, hospitalisation isn't uh, always the best uh, marker of severity. There certainly have been a number of children that have been admitted because both their parents have become unwell and have been unable to care for the child, so they've uh, ended up in hospital uh, because of that. Um, one of the um, burning questions is uh, whether Delta is more severe in children, and uh, this is a research brief done uh, last week which concluded that it probably isn't um, more severe than previous variants, um, but because it spreads faster, the, um, because there are more children becoming unwell, the number of children that get severe disease um, will be greater. So it really is just a function of how many infections there are rather than um, the del Delta strain being um, more infectious by its, uh, more um, severe by itself. Um, this is really reflected in the United States where obviously there's a lot more COVID than uh, we have uh, in Australia. Um, there has been an increase in um, hospitalizations of, in, in very young children um, compared to um, uh, compared to last year. And um, uh, but uh, the uh, vaccination is a tool that's effective in um, in adolescents um, and uh, certainly does seem to be um, preventing hospitalizations in in um, in adolescents. Um, an important question is about um, what people are calling long COVID or um, uh, people that have chronic symptoms or illness after after COVID. Um, this is certainly very well recognised in, in adults, but isn't so, quite so clear as to um, how common this might be in children. 
Um, uh, in the last couple of days, there's been a uh, systematic review of uh, 14 studies published um, from the Murdoch Jordan's Research Institute uh, from uh, Nigel Curtis there, where he looked at uh, studies that looked at almost 20,000 children that had COVID. Um, uh, these studies have described um, symptoms um, of headache and fatigue and those symptoms there listed there for up to three months after, um, after COVID, but they largely resolve after that. It's important to note that some of these, uh, you know, sleep disturbance and concentration difficulties also um, could be due to other things other than COVID. So obviously, um, uh, you know, in these unusual times that we find ourselves and a lot of people under uh, that have anxiety and stress, uh, that is uh, rubbing off into children. Um, uh, so it is important to look at children that don't have COVID as a, as a control group to see what is happening in the background um, community. And so this is an example of one of those studies from um, the UK where they looked at a control group of people that didn't have COVID, um, uh, children that didn't have COVID, and what they could um, describe here is that um, uh, that um, particularly um, well after um, infection, um, a lot of these symptoms um, occurred in people that didn't have COVID, which suggests that maybe it's not due to the COVID, it's due to the disruption um, of uh, the community um, apart from that. Um, in terms of transmission, um, uh, New South Wales obviously have had a lot of, quite a lot of cases and um, uh, the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance has uh, been following up um, children and uh, published a report a couple of weeks ago. What they found was that um, most of the uh, transmission um, seemed to have occurred in, um, in households, uh, so children are much more at risk of getting uh, COVID in their households, which is not really a surprise. Um, and in uh, schools, there was a secondary attack rate, so meaning that um, the, uh, of all the, all the people that came into contact with a case, uh, about 5% or 1 in 20 of them um, uh, contracted uh, COVID. That rate was slightly higher in um, early uh, childhood education services, so preschools, um, as opposed to primary schools and, uh, and secondary schools. And if you dissect this out into um, whether the adult or the source brought the, uh, was the source case and then the adult or the child was the, um, uh, was the contact, you can see that um, the highest transmission, the highest risk is from adult to adult. Um, so um, just over 10% of um, uh, of uh, adult contacts in a school setting um, became positive, where there's an adult and a child, um, that was 7%. And then if the child was um, the source, then there was a much lower risk of an adult contracting it from the child or a child contracting it from another child. That's not to say that there isn't any transmission, but uh, that rate is much lower than uh, where the adult is the source. So that's the school side. On the household side, um, and this is obviously um, mainly with um, the Delta variant, um, the, there was a much, much higher um, household attack rate. So more than two thirds of household members um, uh, that were contacts of a case um, became positive. Um, but notably, um, all the cases in children were uh, largely asymptomatic or very minimally um, symptomatic. So um, children, you know, not a large number of children here, but most of them um, remained relatively well. It's not to say that even if children don't get sick from COVID that there aren't um, important impacts on children and particularly school closure is um, an important um, uh, and this is the social determinants of health. The um, uh, so disadvantaged children um, uh, have a disproportionate impact on uh, of uh, school closure and there's this education gap that gap that um, uh, education um, uh, educationalists are, are concerned about. There's also the potential, particularly in up in you know uh, the older years in high school, of um, of people becoming disengaged from um, education, and then particularly vulnerable students, uh, those with disabilities, mental health issues, and um, and uh, due to their social circumstances, um, uh, have their supports dis disrupted somewhat by um, school closure, and obviously the broader impacts on the community are also uh, felt by uh, parents and and families as well, and that uh, has impacts on the children. So in terms of um, opening schools, um, obviously um, this is a priority uh, for um, uh, for the community. There are three ways that um, uh, that transmission in schools can be mitigated through just how school is organised, um, the structural and environmental factors, and then what happens if there is a case in a school. So um, the best way to control uh, transmission in schools, obviously, is to um, where we can uh, control it in the community. Um, 
anyone who's unwell should get tested. And then in the US, um, they've taken this approach of trying to get kids to wear masks and then encourage um, children to stay home and um, have uh, what's called cohorting so that school groups stay together rather than mix between uh, different uh, different classes or different years. In the in Europe, um, there's a lot more um, emphasis on symptom screening and um, and uh, cleaning of the environment um, and uh, trying to um, uh, ensure adequate classroom ventilation. Um, there's also needs to be systems to um, to ensure that there is surveillance and contact tracing in schools, and uh, there is uh, discussion. Uh, particular, and this is a strategy that's been adopted in the UK of uh, trying to test um, students fairly regularly to try and identify students before they come to school. So I might um, hand over to Nigel at this point to um, talk about um, the vaccines that are available for children and um, some of those issues. No, thanks, um, Alan, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak um, this evening. And I, I think this um, webinar is a good example of we're thinking obviously of, of protection across the community, across the life course. So it's great that we now have two vaccine products that can be um, available for 12 year olds. And people might have seen in the news that um, the spike vax or Moderna vaccine has just arrived in Australia. I think had some TGA um, clearance um, this last couple of days and expecting that to roll out into pharmacies at the ends of the week. So here, here just outlines the, the two different vaccines that are available in the 12 to 17 year old. Uh, they're both from the same class or the mRNA um, vaccine. So I consider them reasonably you know, equivalent in terms of the way that they work. And people might have heard as much of spike vax or Moderna because um, Pfizer has been the name we've all been hearing about and, and obviously had a lot more experience with. But certainly Moderna is one of the very first vaccines to get through those early phase clinical trials that was developed in the United States in collaboration with the NIH and um, progressed very quickly to market. So a relatively new company, but certainly, um, as you can see from the table here, very equivalent um, effectiveness. So this is measuring in the clinical trials, what's your chance of becoming um, particularly unwell uh, with COVID. So that's including going to, to hospitalization um, as part of those endpoints and um, you know, again, looking uh, with the Moderna vaccine up to 96%, and that seems to be holding out uh, over lots of the different studies seen internationally and very um, similar to the, the Pfizer vaccine you can see on the left side. The link at below there, this is um, John Hart and Fiona Russell from University of Melbourne and, and MCRI who put this together as a weekly update. So it's a great way to kind of visually see um, some of the latest data, including that in children. Uh, in terms of the top line, just, just to clarify that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not available in children. That's only licensed for 18 and plus. So we're really only looking at these two vaccines and they are being used in multiple countries. You can see in that right column, they're being used broadly, uh, particularly in the United States and Canada, which I'll talk to um, in a moment. Next slide. Thanks, Alan. So again, obviously, Atagi has been deliberating this question and, and initially it came out of the 12 to 15 year old um, advice in terms of the, the recommendation, particularly those that initially at, at higher risk or special risk. So that was those with underlying medical conditions as well as um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, um, essentially as part of that community protection. We know we obviously had a recommendation from 16 to um, 60 for everyone to access the vaccine straight away. That's now broadened obviously to the 12 to 15 year olds as well. Um, and all of those living in those remote communities was the first part of advice. The second advice really just talked to vaccines in adolescents more broadly and essentially 12 and above can now access the vaccine as, as mentioned. So um, really important to think about then some of those younger age groups. We'll see a few questions already in the chat around that. At the moment, we don't have any licensed um, products in under 12, but both of these vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are doing trials in the 5 to 11 year olds and actually all the way down to six months. And we're expecting more data on those studies in coming months, particularly in the 5 to 11 year olds we can maybe talk to in the chat. Next slide. Thanks, Alan. So the other thing I think is really helpful to people think about that, you know, as part of the sort of vaccine rollout um, and monitoring, we're watching really closely what happens overseas. And as I said, it's pretty amazing that we have the number of products that we do. They're working so effectively, particularly at that severe end in terms of hospitalization, but also at transmission, which which clearly is um, important. And the United States, while they're not quite at the coverage level they would like, there's a big population. So you can see from the link here that at least um, in the 12 to 17 year old age group, there's been 13.9 million doses given or 55 percent and actually fully vaccinated 11 million. So a real sort of wealth of experience, clinical trials can only ever be up to you know 30,000 of the big trials in the US as part of that operation warp speed, but they've already vaccinated 11 million full doses. That really can help inform us in terms of um, some of the safety profile, which I'll come to in a moment. Next slide, thanks, Alan. So the 
One thing to flag is that like any um, medication or vaccines, we do see adverse events. And as Alan mentioned, I'm um, uh, head of safety, which is our Victorian Vaccine Safety Service, and we monitor for adverse events. And we were fortunate for Alan to come and join our clinic for a little while where we talk through some of the reactions that can occur following immunisation. And this was one that we were monitoring with these vaccines, or we call them adverse events of special interest. So again, lots of long terms and acronyms in, in immunisation. But the key thing is to know that this was something that we were looking out for. You can see it with covid um, infection, but the vaccines that we use are not live. You can't get COVID itself from the vaccine, but they can sometimes cause inflammation. And we have seen some cases, although they're rare, of both pericarditis, which is the lining of your heart, and also myocarditis, which is the heart itself. And this link to an animation we put together at the Melbourne Vaccine Education Centre um, can sort of talk through it in a visual way what that means and what we're doing to monitor it. So people can watch that, that later if of interest. Next slide, thanks, Ellen. So again, just reflecting back to the United States, um, all of their deliberations are publicly facing and go up on the website. So again, um, you can go onto their CDC and look at their reports of myocarditis and they've given us some really important data, both in terms of the likelihood of this occurring post the vaccine, the risk factors and, and the follow up. So next slide, thanks. Alan. So this slide again, a little bit busy, but just maybe take you straight to the, the red um, boxes. They're looking at both um, the three vaccines used in the US, so Pfizer, Moderna, and also Janssen, which is a um, similar to AstraZeneca, but single dose. And the two red boxes just flag out that the main concern uh, of where this is occurring is in males of a younger age, so generally under 30, and um, less common in, in females and after the second dose. And the rates that we're seeing are around, you know, one in 20 to 30,000 doses. So this is not a common uh, effect. If we vaccinate um, 100,000 people, we may see three um, up to potentially five cases. So not common, but something that we need to be aware of. Um, clearly articulate that to community and, and some of the symptoms to look out for um, are going to be important. So uh, next slide, Alan, I think we go through um, some of the side effects. So this is just jumping again to, to Canada, other colleagues who are um, clearly also vaccinating at a high level. So again, really high rates in, in Canada in terms of um, protection, again, using predominantly Pfizer and Moderna. So similar to the two vaccines that we have and nearly 70% fully um, vaccinated in, in Canada. So again, a lot of lessons being learned from our colleagues there and, and great coverage already. So really sort of sets where the bar we might want to get to um, in Australia in terms of um, getting to 70, 80 and then, and then beyond in terms of our protection, including those adolescents. Next slide. This slide just shows that the onset of the symptoms of this myocarditis, pericarditis is really in that first um, week, so sort of five to seven days. So that bottom line is just the days since your vaccine and then the number of cases and a rate just shows by age. So certainly it's, um, as I mentioned, a um, bit more common in that younger um, age group and the symptoms generally coming on in that five to seven days. Next slide. So this slide's really important because it's the follow up and, and management. So as mentioned, they've given 11 million doses in that younger age group and of the cases that they've looked here across different ages, it's actually 742 that they've really closely reviewed. So they've heard about the cases um, at the CDC, they've followed them up, chased their charts and worked out what happened to them clinically. So this is really important information to us. And the key take home message on that right side is to say that the majority have gone home and completely recovered. And we certainly have seen a couple of cases in Australia of this condition. Um, majority have been mild, um, may have to go into hospital for a little while to help manage their symptoms with some um, anti-inflammatory um, medications. They may have presented with a little bit of chest pain and shortness of breath, but it does really settle down in a couple of days. Um, they're discharged home in close monitoring with our cardiology colleagues. There's clearly a couple of cases you can see on the bottom here that are still being monitored in the United States, but overwhelmingly um, majority have, have recovered and done really well. So while this is an adverse event, um, the balance, which we'll talk through in a moment, clearly is in favour of vaccination. We do need people to be aware of, of monitoring for this um, potential adverse event and, and the TGA and others are reporting on this really closely. So I think it's reassuring to know that this is being monitored so closely in the, in the community. Next slide, thanks, Alan. So what to look out for, as I sort of touched on a few times, is, is important. So it's that one to five days. There might be some chest pain or some pressure or discomfort. You can imagine that inflammation can cause some of those symptoms. Might be some palpitations or a skipping beat of your heart. Some uh, young people may feel like fainting or a bit short of breath. Um, rarely some sort of pain with breathing. So they're the sort of things to look out for. And we have put together an ATAGI um, statement in, co in collaboration with our 
um, Cardiology Society and also now working with our general practice and emergency department colleagues to make sure we've got a clear plan of what to do if people do turn up with some of these symptoms. They won't always be caused by the vaccine, so we need to you know, reassure majority of people that actual fact there may be other reasons for their chest pain and, and other symptoms that might occur, but we do have some things in place of how we can monitor and, and manage that. And this statement, um, you know, obviously constantly being reviewed and updated as more information comes to hand, but the link at the bottom there, and you can go to that guidance if you'd like some uh, further information. Next slide, thanks, Alan. So this slide again, people might have seen, you know, different risk benefit um, slides. And again, you know, Alan helped put this one, you know, together, really can see that benefits on, on the left side. So there's that protection um, against infection, which again, I can see things in the chat about it, it being rare, but as mentioned, if we, um, as we start to open up, we will see more cases and therefore we will see more hospitalization. So there is definitely direct protection, particularly for adolescents with risk factors, who we know it's really important to protect. So there's definitely direct protection there's also protection against that um, severe disease and long COVID. And there's also protection of the family. So I think we should think of COVID-19 vaccine programs as everyone now 12 and above, the whole family can come and get vaccinated. And again, that's obviously happening through the hubs, through general practice and primary care. And also now, as I mentioned before, the pharmacies um, 12 plus for the, the Moderna. So we've really got to try to think about how we maximise protection of everyone and including those um, most vulnerable obviously trying to um, minimise that protection and, you know, some of the anxiety that um, goes with that. And, and probably other thing is then at school. So clearly, you know, we know the year 12, there's been a big um, blitz in New South Wales and now here in Victoria. I've heard we've close to 50%, I think, of um, year 12s have, have now had first dose of the vaccine, which is fantastic. And we want to get them, you know, back to school and, and finishing their studies at, with face-to-face -face learning, which will be part of the road plan that was announced yesterday. So I think thinking of the whole community and protection is also important, but also being really clear that there definitely is direct protective effects for those um, 12 and older as well. On the right hand side, we clearly have the, the risk of myocarditis, which as mentioned was between two to, to five per 100,000. So a really rare adverse event, which can be managed um, with appropriate you know, identification, which is gonna be important. Anaphylaxis or allergy, which you haven't touched on that, that's allergic reaction. So some people may have allergic reaction to um, you know, peanuts or penicillin or other medications, they can occur with, with vaccines, but actually very uncommon. And, and we do have colleagues at the um, Austin and the um, Monash and also RCH that can help manage any allergic reactions, but it's very um, uncommon. And the, the link there again below, just giving that bit of a balance, definitely you can see myocarditis, pericarditis following the infection itself. So the balance between um, having the infection of COVID again in adolescence can cause some of these cardiac symptoms versus the rare risk of the vaccine really pushes towards the benefit um, profile. Next slide, thanks, Alan. So again, in terms of talking to children, that's one of the flavours today. And again, we can't touch on all that. Hopefully we have a few questions from children or other groups. But if people haven't seen this um, yet, I would recommend it. So this was a QA and a that was really led by um, children and some adolescents um, on the panel as well. So Anthea Rhodes and Fiona Russell, again, colleagues from RCH are on the panel. Uh, Norman Swan and Virginia, Virginia Trioli, as, as I mentioned, as well as some excellent um, uh, adolescents and, and young people asking the questions. So it was a really good discussion. I certainly sent that to lots of colleagues and friends to, to have a listen. If you haven't yet, I'd, I'd really recommend it because it raises and discusses lots of those issues. Next slide. And we do want to touch a little bit on the on the vaccine confidence. Again, this could be a whole um, you know delivery or topic in itself, and it may be something in in the future if there's interest to discuss it. But here, this one slide just really captures there's there's different components um, to why might people be um, hesitant, and and some of that is um, the confidence in the safety. So hopefully we've mentioned some of those issues around safety, and particularly the the information sharing from our colleagues internationally who are ahead of us in terms of the vaccine delivery and follow up. And then the, the confidence in the delivery of the system. And again, we've clearly got a really strong immunisation program supported by the Department of Health, but also in primary care and, and now pharmacies as mentioned. So everyone's motivated to try and deliver a safe and um, effective program with constant monitoring of how that's um, all progressing. And hesitancy is also related to um, convenience and, and access, and that's really important. And we've heard that particularly from our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander colleagues. We know in particularly in Sydney and, and now in Western New South Wales that access and availability has been a major issue. So making sure that it's available in a timely way, people can get to those appointments and access the vaccine is clearly um, a part of reason why some people may not be fully vaccinated. And then there's that risk benefit. Again, I think there's a few questions coming around mandates and, and other discussions. There's the 
perception that the risk may be low at an individual and then there's obviously the the pressures in terms of society and that community impact so trying to understand that balance and and again just in terms of pediatric or young people vaccination i've not heard of any discussions around mandate in, in under 18 so no suggestion that that's going to be on the the table at this stage uh in terms of the pediatric population but again so lots of things you know being discussed but but can reassure people that's not part of any plans i've i've heard of to date uh, next slide so just linking to a few resources again as, as mentioned earlier on we do have the melbourne vaccine education center um, based at um, mcri and rch which has some resources and and links there in terms of COVID 19 as well as that animation i i mentioned earlier next slide so now alan if you sort of throw back to you in, in a moment but again there's plenty of time i think for questions which is great so again just try to you know relate that it is generally a milder disease compared to adults and obviously as they get older a bit more likely to get more severe infection if they do have those risk factors um, they may be more likely to end up in hospital so important to protect them as mentioned for both direct protection while severe complications are rare they, they do occur so there is a, a rationale to try and protect them through vaccination and again we have done the, the whole presentation could have focused on some of those um, you know non-specific or non sort of infectious related effects of schooling and social isolation that, that's happened through the pandemic so really important to um, know that we now do have vaccines here in Australia. Um, both um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are available in, in the 12 plus. Uh, we feel that the benefits, you know, really outweigh those risks at the moment, but clearly mitigating some of those other impacts will be important. And, and while there is a small risk of myopericarditis with the vaccines, we're well aware of that across the vaccine safety landscape and lots of work being done to um, monitor that and, and treat it, but majority are mild and, and self-limiting. Thanks, Alan. Thanks very much, uh, Nigel. I might uh, stop sharing so I can have a look at uh, some of the um, questions. So um, uh, we might just go. So in terms of, um, so we might just, um, I'll throw to Nigel for a few of them, but uh, just in terms of statistics in Australia, I think those were the um, the numbers I presented at the beginning with um, the uh, numbers as of a few weeks ago. Um, there's obviously been a number of cases since then, um, but I think that sort of ratio of about you know two or three percent of children uh, being hospitalised. Some of those um, are due to social reasons, so that their parents are unwell and can't look after them. Um, but uh, children going to intensive care um, is very rare, and um, uh, there's been one death uh, due to pneumococcal meningitis, and probably with COVID rather than due to COVID. Um, in terms of the first and second dose, um, uh, Nigel, I don't know if you want to take that one about uh, the optimal timing uh, interval between the first and second doses. Um, so again, obviously lots of different advice around that, but probably just to be aware of what sort of the minimum interval is, and then there has been some variation in terms of the, the second dose, but for the Pfizer or common RT vaccine, it's three weeks, and for Moderna or Spike Vax, it's four weeks. So that's the minimum interval we'd recommend having those vaccines. There has been different guidance coming out just to try and make sure we get as many people starting their program as possible. So some immunisation hubs in Victoria now sort of fallen on six weeks as the window to, to get those two vaccines. Um, and again, there's some flexibility, you know, around that, but um, certainly they work really well. You know, anytime post those minimum intervals, they're, they're definitely effective vaccines. Yeah. Um, so the next question is about any health issues or medications that make it not safe for a child to get the vaccine. Um, I can't think of any. The, the only issue sometimes arises where um, people are, are going to be or children are going to be on immunosuppression. So, for example, they might have Crohn's disease and need um, steroids or um, other immunosuppression. That's not a safety issue that um, if it's uh, um, obviously the issue there is uh, the vaccine may not work as well. Um, so therefore, um, the recommendation is to try and get it in before uh, they um, go on uh, those sorts of medications or um, alternatively if they come off it. But um, usually, um, I think in children, they are you know, usually on it for a while. So um, it, the best it's best to try and get it on, uh, get it into them um, before um, they go into immunosuppression. Uh, just a cu couple of more like, things, sort of Alan related to that. Probably the other the two things people are aware of is just around the allergy. So if you have obviously anaphylaxis to the first dose, you, you wouldn't get um, the second dose with obviously detailed review in the allergy clinic. Or if you're allergic to a component of the vaccine, there are obviously additives and things that need to make these vaccines. So there's sometimes people need to be um, seen and reviewed to that. And again, they can come to our specialist clinics like we have at RCH to discuss those um, issues. And the second one, there are a few precautions around the vaccine particularly around this, this heart inflammation. And the main one would be if you've recently had pericarditis or myocarditis, and that's actually of any age, because 
Um, pericarditis obviously can occur at, at other ages for other reasons as well. And we'd like you to have completely recovered from that. So if you did have pericarditis, you know, a month ago, it was either still ongoing, we really ask you to talk to your primary care physician or your cardiologist or through one of the immunisation clinics to make sure you'd fully recovered before you had the vaccine. Not we think it's likely it's going to flare it, but just very much a precaution. Thanks, Alan. Actually, that probably just leads to the next question about um, avoiding exercise after vaccination to reduce the risk of myocarditis. So I think Singapore had um, actually given that advice, but um, it's not, as far as I know, Nodule, it's not really based on, on any evidence to say that exercise after vaccination increases the risk of myocarditis. That, that's not known, is it? No, that's right. I think we heard that that case in, in Singapore, someone was doing quite a lot of exercise post when they had emerging myocarditis and then ended up in hospital. So as sort of a reaction to that, they recommended, you know, considering holding off an exercise for the week post vaccine for everybody. But we don't think that's the right approach because it's such a rare condition that we've already mentioned. So the main thing is sort of listening to your body or symptoms. So obviously 12 and over, most of them can hopefully understand those symptoms or if they're a carer, they can kind of see out for those things. So if that week post the vaccine, they had some shortness of breath or chest pain, they shouldn't push through it and, you know, keep doing things. They should pause and stop and tell their family and, and take themselves to their GP or emergency if they need to. So no exercise sort of not, not to stop completely, but just to be aware of those symptoms and, and alert um, your family if you have them. A couple of questions on um, Pfizer or Moderna. Um, I think so. It's probably just important to say that both of them have been studied in large trials, and uh, both of them have uh, gone through the, the provisional registration process by the TGA, and uh, so are both regarded as uh, valid vaccines or and safe and effective vaccines uh, for children. Um, there's not really any head-to-head -head studies to say if one is better, and in fact, both of them are are quite similar in the way that they're constructed. So, um, you know, the side effects for one tend to be the side effects for the other. Um, the Moderna dose is slightly higher. I think it's, uh, um, uh, so it's a slightly bigger um, volume and a slightly higher dose of the mRNA molecule. But um, I think in general, we regard them as, um, as pretty similar to each other. Um, there was a uh, question about um, the risks and um, risks and benefits, um, uh, Nigel, about um, why do we vaccinate kids if um, their risk of becoming seriously unwell or needing hospitalizations are, are uncommon? Yeah, so hopefully we touched on that in, in the presentation, but I think, you know, as mentioned, there's, there's two levels why you sort of put forward for a vaccination. One is sort of that individual direct protection. So while it is less common, we certainly do see adolescents attend hospital and, and some will end up in ICU. And Probably back to that paper from the United States with the Delta wave with some high cases, particularly in some states, they showed that you're actually 10 times less likely to end up in hospital if you it had a vaccine. So, and, and you're confirmed um, COVID-19 positive. And acknowledging the numbers are relatively low compared to other groups, it certainly did have a dramatic reduction in those presentations. Um, so while the risk is lower, there is that direct protection. And as back to all those other factors, if we can get really high coverage in the 12 and over in our schools and get ourselves back to a place where everyone you know can start to function as a community if they get the infection less likely to give it to their grandparents for example who may be protected but the vaccine may not work as well or as long in in some groups so the way to protect the community is by everyone in that family 12 and over across the life course being protected so i think there's sort of two big reasons why we want young people to be vaccinated Oh, there's a really good question here, uh, Nigel, that I um, hope you might be able to take is, um, so this is, um, Kate has a daughter who's 14 and is concerned about long-term side effects, about, you know, the development of the vaccine and um, potential impact on fertility. I guess the question is probably a little bit less about what are the actual side effects, but perhaps more about how does um, Kate talk to her daughter about, um, uh, about um, you know, side effects and risks and benefits. How would you how would you have that approach that conversation with children? Yeah, so I think uh, important if it's a 14 year old, then they all should be in the room and having the discussions. I think it's really important to focus that conversation on the young person and them to get to ask their questions with their parents there with them to help, you know, with that. So again, you know, Alan, you sat in our, our clinic and we had lots of these discussions and this sort of question was flagged, you know, early on with the HPV vaccine or the human papilloma virus vaccine, which got launched in now 2007, so 14 years ago, and there's concerns then around the impact that might have on, on fertility and lots of close monitoring and follow-up confirmed that, that that wasn't the case, but it did mean we had lots of discussions around some of those concerns in, in young people. But 
I think reassurance is very much that this is something that's been considered and monitored. And again, those big numbers, you know, the United States in terms of vaccination and coverage hasn't flagged a concern around um, fertility, but again, something that's obviously been closely um, monitored. Again, just being really clear, these are not live vaccines, they're not giving COVID or impacting on any systems in terms of um, impact on, on um, fertility, both male, male and female, to be honest, that's been flagged. So I think just open acknowledging those concerns of the young person, trying to address their questions or queries as, as best you can, send them to resources. There's some really good resources now being developed, uh, including some on our um, MVEC page around this question, and then just not yeah, you know, making sure there's a chance for follow up and discussion and, and reassure that there is long term follow up, both in the clinical trials as well as as part of these you know larger surveillance in the community. So hopefully you can reassure and address those specific questions as they arise with the with the young person. Uh, there's a good question here about um, uh, the UK recommendations for um, so, so they, they've rec recommended a single dose of uh, vaccine for children, uh, I think under the age of 18. Um, my interpretation of that is they're saying one dose at the moment rather than that they're confident that one dose will last um, forever. Um, and I think our assessment is that they will be giving a second dose at some stage, um, but uh, obviously that will be their decision to make. Um, we've said upfront that we think that it probably is um, that two doses um, will be required to provide longer lasting protection and that those um, uh, ris the, the risks are outweighed by the benefits of uh, preventing COVID and particularly um, that you know, there's no other alternative vaccine. That we can't use AstraZeneca in, in children. Um, uh, or we don't rec we don't prefer it in in children because of the risks of other side effects. Um, that we think it's uh, still safest to give um, uh, the uh, Pfizer or um, Moderna vaccines. Um, Maybe just adding a little bit onto that, Alan, if that's okay. So I think you're right. This has been obviously a, a broad discussion. Why different countries would have different recommendations, and I think we do need to try and um, articulate that. So the other different thing to the UK is they've had so much you know, wild type infection. They've had, you know, huge numbers of cases and unfortunately, um, you know, deaths as well. So definitely the protection when they start to do tests, you know, checking people's blood to see if they've been exposed to this virus is much higher than Australia, who despite our waves, even in Victoria, we know our uh, prevalence in the community is very low, including a study we did at um, the Children's Hospital in our, um, you know, follow up, they've all been extremely low in terms of um, having seen the virus before. So therefore, we do think that two doses is likely to be required. Acknowledging one dose does work pretty well at the, for that severe or hospitalisation end. You really need the two doses to try and impact on transmission and, and other impacts. And I do think the UK decision may make it a bit confusing for those higher risk patients. So we mentioned before, those with immune suppression and others who may not respond as well will actually need two doses. So it's possible one 14 year old will turn up and it's a single dose, but those that are actually in higher risk may be needing a second dose. You actually can confuse the schedule then when you have a mixed message and you're waiting for a second dose because they were recommended to give a higher dose, so two dose schedule to those higher risk patients pretty early on. So while they're kind of sitting on the fence for that second dose, I think there's a capacity for confusion. So I think sitting with a two dose schedule you know, is where Australia's at at the moment. Um, thanks. There's a good question about um, what are, uh, which children with heart conditions might um, uh, should avoid the vaccine. I think um, we covered that a little bit before in saying that um, it's basically children with um, inflammatory heart conditions. So they have had myocarditis, it's not related to the vaccine or pericarditis or um, endocarditis. So they're inflammation of different parts of the heart. Um, and uh, if they, if you have any of those, then obviously you're probably going to be managed by a cardiologist and um, take their advice. I think for other groups and um, the one a group in Australia that we're particularly um, obviously interested in is uh, children with rheumatic heart disease, um, and that's uh, mainly Aboriginal children up in the in the top end. Again, if they have active heart inflammation, then um, they probably just need to avoid the vaccine while that's settling down. Um, but certainly if, um, for example, children with congenital heart disease, um, uh, if you have any concerns, obviously um, see a doctor about it uh, and talk it through. But uh, we generally don't regard that as a uh, as a reason not to have a vaccine. In fact, it's probably a good reason to get vaccinated to prevent the effects of COVID. Uh, Nigel, if you want to add to that. No, I think you're, I think that well, Alan. I think, um, yeah, when we first put out our advice, we mentioned quite a few precautions because we were just learning about this condition as it came out. But at the same time, it was very much a precaution and we didn't want to have a barrier 
to people attending. So as you mentioned, we're just sort of tighten that up with our cardiology colleagues to say it's really that you know acute inflammation and that precaution discussion. But the majority, as mentioned from that United States case series I mentioned, they didn't identify any clear risk factors outside of um, age and, and, and male. So yeah, nothing sort of flagging for us at the moment in terms of other groups that are higher risk for these conditions. So you're really supportive of vaccination in those groups. Um, there's a question about the interval between HPV or the routine childhood vaccines, I guess, and um, and COVID uh, vaccines. I think at the moment we're still recommending seven days as a as the gap between um, vaccines that aren't live and um, which is HPV and, and meningococcal vaccines, which are the year seven uh, vaccines, um, and <clears throat> and the COVID vaccine. I think there's still ongoing studies to work out if you can just give them together. But um, and I think other countries have actually said. It's probably fine, but in general, um, probably the safest thing to do would be just to separate that by a week. Part of that is about side effects to make sure that you know which side effect is uh, due to which vaccine if um, if you get them all at the same time. Um, uh, so uh, this question about um, annual vaccination, I think we don't know at this stage. Um, I think there is some concern, and I think we touched on this uh, in the staff forum uh, last week about uh, boosters. Um, at, at this stage, um, we're not recommending boosters. I think the priority is really just to get everyone's first dose in and second dose in rather than um, starting to think about third doses. But um, obviously it is something we're starting to turn our mind to. Um, I think obviously children are only getting vaccinated now. So um, again, the priority would be to get their first dose and second dose in um, rather than having to think of third doses. And we don't really know at this stage um, how often we might uh, need to give vaccination. Um, and then there's some questions about mixing Moderna and, and Pfizer. Um, I think there's not really much evidence on this, um, Nigel. I don't know if you know of any studies of mix and match um, mRNA vaccines. I think um, that'll be coming, Alan. So I know that um, Matthew Snape and the Oxford group have done lots of sort of mix and match, you know, studies. So initially they had obviously AstraZeneca as their first line, then Pfizer, but now Moderna being used. So I know that's being included in some of their follow up studies and looking at the sort of safety profile, but then also the immunogenicity is, is going to be important. But definitely Canada, I know, had lots of mixed schedules. They had supply issues for Moderna and Pfizer in different parts of Canada and um, did make actually a mixed recommendation for those that had dose one AstraZeneca and then, and then follow up with an mRNA vaccine. So there is a lot of practical experience in the in Canada with that mixed um, schedule. But again, sort of seeing that data and you know, the analyze that need to be coming. But from first principles, they are obviously similar vaccines in terms of how they've made and protection. So we'll need to understand, you know, those combinations and, and it may be possible that there will be mixed schedules over time, but I think we need to wait for advice to kind of be clear, um, clear around that. Um, I saw a couple of questions on um, um, changing menstrual, menstrual cycles and potential fertility issues. So I think um, with in regard to fertility issues, I think that there's um, no real theoretical reason why um, there might be any impact on uh, fertility. And usually when or when uh, vaccines are developed as part of the preclinical work, there's, um, you know, they immunize animals and, and monitor effects on uh, fertility and whether it might um, affect uh, the newborn. And there's been certainly no uh, signal there. In terms of changing menstrual cycles, um, I think this has been a signal that's been looked at by the TGA as well as other regulators around the world. And um, I think the, the UK and um, uh, the TGA have both said that they don't think that that's a, a real thing. Obviously, people's um, menstrual cycles can change due to other reasons. Um, uh, but um, so it's still, I think it's still being looked into, but it's not felt to be um, a, a significant um, complication and, and, prob and probably isn't uh, related to the vaccine. I don't know, Nigel, if there's anything else that you know about that. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, um, Sonia Grover, one of our adolescent um, gynecologists, we sort of asked her this question and she discussed it with our, our clinical group. And she made the point that um, in very stressful environments such as, you know, Japan studied this in quite a lot of detail around Fukushima and the nuclear accident and actually the change in menstrual cycles that happens in a stressful situation and particularly, you know, being in lockdown and all the other things that are happening at a, at a um, community level that in itself may impact on menstrual cycle and changes. But I think we definitely got to acknowledge that it has been reported to our safety service. It has been reported, you know, nationally to these groups. And I think the US are, you know, putting a bit of research and, and funding into understanding the question in a bit more detail. So definitely acknowledging that it's happening don't appear to be a clear 
you know, driver or, or other reason as mentioned, this is not a live vaccine, but definitely it's being acknowledged and, and looked to in, in more detail. And then there's a couple of other questions about um, so children under 12. At this stage, we don't have um, a vaccine that is um, registered for our children under 12. Those studies are underway. In fact, I expect them that um, that data will start to be released over the next couple of weeks or, or month or so. Um, I think when that happens, then we will have to do the same sort of thinking about, you know, is it safe, effective, and um, you know, it, it does, does the benefits of being vaccinated outweigh um, any safety signals that might emerge. Um, but um, at this stage, we don't have that vaccine, so um, there's not really anything to look at. But when that data comes through, we'll be looking at it closely. Um, the interesting question um, about um, a weight limit. Um, uh, so, um, and is particularly relevant to me. I have um, a very, very small 12 year old myself. Um, and uh, I, the, so the studies that are being done in children under 12 actually um, are using a slightly smaller dose, but um, there is no weight limit for uh, children um, 12 and over, as I understand. If that's right. Yeah, no, that's right. And maybe just add, just in addition to that, just for the listeners, that the, the trials are sort of looking in different groups. So it's sort of five to 11. So the next one that's going to come through is a primary school age. And that's probably a lot of people have 12 year olds and eight or nine year olds. Lots of questions around, you know, not, not the whole family being protected, but that'll be the next group. Then there'll be the look at the um, the preschool, sort of two to four year olds, and then the six months to two year olds. And as Alan mentioned, they're looking at the dose and modifying, but trials are already looking down to that six months and over. And we know that babies can be protected if their mother, um, when pregnant, has the vaccine. I'm sure Michelle Giles and other colleagues have touched base on that. So definitely, again, as mentioned, we're looking at the life course from pregnancy to the six month being protected to then six months up to 100 plus years having a vaccine. So pretty amazing that we may have vaccine products, you know, in 2022 that can actually be used across the, the life course, which is fantastic. Maybe just two last questions before we finish. So um, anaphylaxis and um, and uh, children, Nigel, I think you. Uh, so with um, uh, so anaphylaxis is a recognised um, uh, side effect of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, but it's thought to be uh, due to a very specific component. So children that have, for example, a peanut allergy or allergy to something else, uh, in general, um, uh, uh, should be fine with um, uh, Pfizer. There is a little bit of concern about children that are allergic to, um, I think it's polyethylene glycol and um, or children that might be allergic to intravenous medications that might suggest that they're allergic to polyethylene glycol, which is in some of these um, IV medications. It's a very unusual and specific um, allergy. And in those sorts of circumstances, I think um, they, uh, the, the recommendation is they probably should um, have an, their vaccination under medical supervision. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Nigel. That's... Yeah, no, thanks, um, Alan. So again, when we very first started the program with the Pfizer vaccine in the, in the US and elsewhere, there was higher reports of anaphylaxis initially, but a lot of those related, we think, to the sort of rolling out the vaccine rather than true allergy at that time. The adrenaline was appropriately given, and those rates have now come down to what we've seen with other vaccines. So as you mentioned, risk with um, other um, allergy such as a single allergy to a peanut doesn't make you at higher risk for allergy and the rate is actually about one to two per million so very rare to see true anaphylaxis and again our Canadian colleagues in the pediatric space are reassuring us they're not seeing more than they would see with the normal vaccines. Monash and RCH as I mentioned do have allergy clinics where we've seen children again Kirsten Perrot at RCH leads that you know for us and um, essentially we can see some of those um, PEG anaphylaxis cases for example to vaccinate safely but for the majority of the community, yeah, very uncommon to see true allergy. We're not expecting to see high rates, but again, all immunisation providers are always prepared and ready. You know, with a gentleman, we're going to wait for that 15 minutes to make sure we don't see any immediate um, allergic reactions. Yeah, certainly, um, you know, as part of the training that uh, vaccinated vac immunisation providers receive is the thing that you look for is is to make sure that you can manage um, anaphylaxis and there's a whole checklist about what needs to be in the clinic and um, what um, the training that everyone needs to have. Um, and certainly it's a, again, it's another area that if you're concerned, it's probably worth having a chat to your GP about, um, you know, what is the nature of the allergy that your child might have and um, what advice might they give about um, our precautions for that. And then perhaps the last question about um, the risk for primary school age, um, uh, yeah, primary school age children who obviously can't get the vaccine at this stage. Um, so I think I touched on that, uh, that the risk, you know, that the uh, children who get COVID are generally uh, relatively well. I think the 
the um, the most common bad thing that can happen is that their parents become unwell and then um, uh, then unable to look after the children. Um, but um, in general, um, we think that uh, children by and large have either asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic um, infection. Um, there are things that can be done to um, prevent transmission in schools and um, uh, 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 in Victoria the recommendation is that they wear masks as, as well as uh, primary school age children can wear masks and, um, and then um, just um, teaching them about um, hand hygiene and, um, and, and, um, and making sure that they don't come to school when they're unwell. Uh, again, Nigel, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I think the main thing I'd say for protecting younger children is to get everyone around them, you know, vaccinated, acknowledging those kind of things within the school. But I think if um, all of the teachers are vaccinated, we showed that sort of adult transmission is the most likely thing that's going to happen in the in the school place. If the carers, if your babysitter, if um, everyone who comes in contact with the household is protected, then the chance of transmission that younger child is, is diminished. So I think, yeah, the way you protect those who can't receive the vaccine is to have everyone around them and everyone 12 plus you know, should be able to access a vaccine. So I think that's the, the best strategy at the moment. Yeah. And OK, and one maybe one last question about um, uh, a, a child who had um, some some expected side effects after um, a, a first dose of Pfizer. Um, so I've described headaches, fatigues and uh, some disturbed sleep and then the third day was fine. I think this would be something that we would expect to see after a Pfizer vaccine. Um, it does, side effects do tend to be a little bit worse with the second dose than the first dose for Pfizer, unlike AstraZeneca in adults, which is usually the opposite way around. Um, so, but um, if it's not myocarditis or pericarditis or you know something um, particularly serious, uh, then we would recommend that they should have the um, this, uh, they should have their second dose. Okay, that probably just leaves it with me to, uh, to me to thank Nigel for um, for ca coming along um, and uh, and helping us with all of this, and uh, thank uh, all of you for attending. I see there's almost 900 people online, which is uh, which is great. Um, so hopefully we've. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to answer all the questions. I think there's about 400 question, unanswered questions there, so um, we're not able to get to all of them. Um, but hopefully we've answered uh, most of the burning issues that you've had. So. Thank you very much and um, um, good evening. Thanks, Al. Cheers.